Hello everyone, in this video we'll discuss the memory map of the computer, uh, we'll see what the consequences are of the 6502 emulation mode um, on, of the CPU on the memory map, uh, and we'll design the address decoding circuit. Uh, so I hope you enjoy! In the past video we've been building this debug module that lets us display with LEDs the contents of the data bus, the address bus, and some of the control lines of the CPU. We've also been able to execute the first instructions on the CPU, mainly NOPS, uh, to see that it was working. And now what I want to do is to add some ROM to the CPU so we can actually write programs. But before we do that, we have to decide on a memory map and how we're going to decode that memory map. So one thing I want to point out is that the CPU has a 6502 emulation mode. If you look at the datasheet, you can see that it says that the CPU is a fully static 16-bit microprocessor featuring software compatibility with the 8-bit NMOS and CMOS 650 series predecessors. And the asterisk here says that it's valid except for the bit manipulation instructions, uh, which do not exist for the 65C816. But basically, except for these instructions, you can run 6502 programs on the CPU. Even though it's 16 bits, you can emulate uh, an 8 bit architecture. And the way to do that is via a software switch. So a software switch determines if the processor is in the 8 bit quote-unquote emulation mode, or in a native mode, thus allowing existing systems to use the expanded features. So let's see how this emulation mode works. So the status of the emulation mode is present in the processor status register. You can see here that the emulation selects and the break flags are accessible only through the processor status register. The emulation mode select flag is selected by the exchange carry and emulation bits instruction. And the reason for that is you can see here the processor's status register. The carry bit and the emulation bit are linked and you can only access the carry bit except through the exchange carry with emulation instruction. On top of that, CPU has a pin that reports whether the emulation mode or the native mode is active. And it's actually just the value of the emulation mode flag in the processor status register. So let's see if we can add an LED uh, to the emulation pin. Okay, so this is our breadboard where we left off the last time. As you can see, it's still executing knobs. So the first thing I want to do is to add an LED on the emulation pin. So that's pin 35 of the CPU. So this is going to be the emulation LED. And as you can see, by default, it's one. We can disable it. Let me put the clock into pulse mode. So the way to move into native mode is to first clear the carry bit because the carry bit is set on reset. And you can do that with the clear carry instruction, which is hex 18. So we need to clock that. And then we can use the exchange carry with emulation bit instruction, XCE, which is hex FB. This will transfer the carry bit, which is zero at the moment, to the emulation bit. So if you clock this, then we can see we moved into native mode and the LED turned off. And if we want to move into emulation mode again, we just use the same instruction. And here you go. The E bit is set again. So let's quickly add this new LED to KiCad. So the first thing you'll notice is I upgraded to KiCad 6, which got released over the holidays. So let's get started. So I'm going to add it to the debug module. There we go. So before we go any further, I'd like to talk about some vocabulary, mainly what is a bank and what is a page of memory. So if you think about a 24-bit address that the CPU can manipulate, you can split it into three 8-bit sections. The least significant 8 bits determine the offset. And so this is a page. So there is 
two to the power of eight memory locations inside a page. That's 256 bytes. Then you can have 256 pages uh, because the page number is also an 8-bit number and that's going to be a bank and one bank is going to contain 2 to the power of 16 so that's 64 kilobytes and then for the full 24 bits of address space there are 256 banks again because the bank number is an 8-bit number and so the total addressable memory space of the 65C816 is 2 to the power of 24 and that's 16 megabytes. So let's consider the emulation and the native modes. So as I said, the emulation mode mimics a 65C02 to be able to run code written for that CPU. And it's also the default boot state of the 65C816. So by default, it boots into emulation mode. You have to activate native mode with an instruction in order to access the advanced features. So if you compare the, the features of the CPU in the emulation and in the native mode, you can see that in emulation mode, the registers are 8 bits. In native mode, there are 16 bits. Uh, in emulation mode, you can only access 16 bits of address space. So that's 64 kilobytes, just like a 6502 would. In native mode, you can access the whole 24 bits of address space. In emulation mode, the direct page, which is synonym with the zero page in 6502 world, is fixed to bank zero page zero, just like it would on a 6502. But in native mode, it can be moved within bank zero. So you can have multiple zero pages depending on what you want to do with your programs. In emulation mode, the stack is fixed in bank zero page one, just like it would in the 6502. But in the native mode, you can move the stack within bank zero. And then the reset vectors are different. So in the emulation mode, they start at bank zero with a prefix of FFF. And then in the native mode, they start in bank zero with a prefix of FFE. So you have different reset vectors depending on which mode you're in. And so all that is to say that when we design our memory, we have to take these restrictions into account. And in order to support both modes, we need RAM in bank zero, page zero and one. That's to support the direct page and the stack in emulation mode. And we need ROM in bank zero, page FF, and that's to support the reset vectors. So it's actually just like a 6502 system. So as I said in the introduction video to this project, I want to have 32K RAM and 32K ROM in bank zero. That's the... 6502 compatible memory map for use in emulation mode. I also want to add 512K of extended RAM. So that's going to be banked memory used in native mode. And then I want my IO devices mapped at the end of RAM in bank zero so that they remain accessible in both the native and emulation mode. And I'm going to add eight devices with 16 addresses each. And that's the maximum needed to address a 65C22. What does that look like in a picture? As you can see here, I have on the left the total addressable memory of the CPU. You can see that we have the extended RAM here that starts at bank 8. So in bank 0, we're going to have RAM that goes from page 0 almost to the end of page 128. We're going to remove just a bit of RAM in order to have the I.O. devices here. So they're going to be 8 times uh, 16 bytes of address for I.O. This means that we can have the direct page at page 0, the stack page at page 1, and then our general purpose RAM starts at page 2. And then starting at page 128, we have 32K of ROM until the end of the bank. So I'm pretty happy with this memory map. It allows us to make full use of the 32K of RAM and the 32K of ROM, except the IO addresses, and also to add extended RAM for native mode. So how are we going to decode this? So if we look at the bit patterns of the different addresses that we're going to have to decode, I have here the different address ranges, the start and an end address, the size, and then address pins 7 to 23. You can see that for the extended RAM, we're going to have a prefix of 00001, and then we don't care about the rest. For the ROM, IO, and RAM, we need to be in bank zero. So we need to decode A16 to A23 need to be zero. And then for the ROM, it's pretty simple. It's just A15 is one. Then for the IO, we have A15 equals to zero. And then 
A7 to A14 are all ones. And then the RAM is what remains. We're in bank zero. A15 is zero. And then A7 to A14 are not ones all at the same time. So let's go into simulation in order to figure out how we're going to build the address decoding circuit. Okay, so I'm here in digital, which is digital logic simulation software. And I'm going to use this to design the address decoding logic. So the first thing I want to do is I'm going to add inputs for all the address pins. And then I'm going to add outputs for our decoded signals. So the first one is going to be RAM extended. Uh, it's going to be active low. Uh, then we're going to have the RAM. Then we're going to have the IO space. And finally, the RAM. So one thing that is cool with digital is that you can add test cases. And this is going to allow you to run tests on the circuits that you're designing. What I'm going to say here is the following. The way the test cases work is that you can give a table with all the input signals and all the output signals. And the software will check that if it sets these inputs, then the outputs need to be these values. You need to list all the combinations and an X means that it's a down care. So the software will check that all the combinations of zeros and ones uh, for all the Xs in a signal, return the same outputs. So you're able to test really exhaustively all the values uh, that you could possibly set. So I'm going to add a screenshot here of what we saw in the previous document with the address ranges. But when A23, A22, A21 or A20 are, are run, uh, we are not in any defined uh, address range. So all the signals should be one. But if A19 is one and all the previous numbers are zero, then we are in the extended RAM range. So the RAM extended should be zero. Then there is a number of empty banks again. If A18, 17, and 16 are one, uh, then all the outputs are one. Then the ROM is when we are in bank zero and A15 is one. So this means that ROM is zero here. The IO range is when we A15 is zero and then uh, A7 to A14 are one. Uh, so this is zero here and then all the rest is RAM space. Now that we have the test case, we're going to be able to run it repeatedly to verify our circuit. So let's build it. So I'm gonna start by building a really naive version that is not optimized. And afterwards, we're going to talk about how we can change the circuit to make it fit into the chips that we can actually buy and also try to make it fast. So let's get started. So the first thing we're going to do is to be able to check for the extended RAM. For this, we're going to verify that the four first bits of the address space are zeros. So we're going to need a four input OR gate and we're going to root the four first bits of the address space. So if any of them are one, this is going to be one. Then we want, so we actually want this to be a NOR gate. Sorry about that. So if all the four pins here are zero, then this is going to be one. Then we want A19 to be one. And when both of them are one, we are in the extended RAM space. So we need an AND and then let's go to RAM extended. So we should be able to verify that by commenting all the other test cases. Uh, so let me run the tests. Nothing connected to the outputs. Okay, so we need a constant here, constant value of one. Going to all of these. Let's run the tests. And as you can see, the test passed. It's just checking all the values of zero and one for all the address pins. And uh, it's not actually displaying all of them because there are too many. But if something had failed, it would show it. So we can be sure that this is the correct circuit to decode the extended RAM. Now let's do the ROM. So let me edit the test case and add back the RAM space. There we go. So if I run the test now, they're, they're failing because I don't have any circuit connected to it. And you can see that for these values of input pins, is it expected a zero on the RAM signal, but it actually found a one. Uh, so this is a failure. 
So let's implement it. So for the RAM space to be active, we need to be in bank zero. In order to be in bank zero, I'm going to add an eight input NOR gate here. I'm going to move this. There we go. And then this was a 19. Okay, so this is going to be our bank zero signal. And then if all the pins are zero, it's going to be one. So it's an active high signal. And then for the ROM space to be enabled, we need bank zero to be one and a 15 to be one. So this should be the circuit for the one space. As we can see, the tests passed. Now let's do the IO range. So for the IO decoding, I'm going to use a 74AC138. It's a three line to eight line decoder. And the way it works is you have three select inputs, which select which of the eight outputs is Low. So we're going to connect this to pin A6, A5, and A4. And that's going to give us eight devices within the IO memory range. And the way we're going to select the IO memory range is through the enable inputs. So there is one active high input and two active low inputs that all need to be enabled for the chip to work. So the way I'm going to model that in digital, I'm going to have a three input uh, NAND gate and I'm going to invert input two and input three. And so this is going to give us the same logic as the 74AC138. Output is going to be low when the first input is high and the second two inputs are uh, low. So I'm going to give, me my, give myself more space here. So the way to decode the IO space is we need all these pins to be one. So for that, I'm going to use an eight input end gate. And then this is going to be one when all those pins are one. In order to be in the IO space, we need bank zero to be one. We need A15 to be zero. And we need all these pins to be one. But since this is an inverted input that's remaining, I'm actually going to use an eight input NAND gate here. And this is going to give us our IO range. Bank zero is high, A15 is zero, and then all the other pins are one. Let's run the test and it passed. Awesome. So let's do the remaining signal, which is the RAM space. And in order to be in the RAM space, this is going to be a three input end gate. So we need bank zero to be one. We need A15 to be zero. Uh, so we're going to need an inverter here. And then we need this signal to be one because if any of those pins are zero, uh, this is going to be one. So we can just wire it directly to our end gates. So this is going to be your RAM space. Let's run the tests. And yeah, they passed. Awesome. So let me just say here that this is a 138 chip. Okay. Now that we have this working as a first draft, we have to think about how we're going to implement this logic in the real world. So remember that my goal for the CPU is to not use any CPLD and to only use through-hole chips. Uh, so this is quite limiting in the terms of what logic gates you can use, especially the multiple inputs one. So I've listed in this spreadsheet the chips I'm actually able to purchase and the propagation delays for the HC family and the AC family. You can see, for example, that the 74HC30, which is an eight input NAND, which we might want to use, is only available in HC. You can actually get a 74ACT11030, which is also an eight input NAND, and that is much faster, but that chip is quite expensive at around three euros. I've listed here all the regular logic gates and also the propagation delays of the 74HC and AC138 with respect to the selection pins and the active high and active low enables. And then some specialty chips. So the 74HC4002, which is a four input NOR, the 74HC4075, which is a three input OR. You can uh, purchase both of those chips new. 
and then one obsolete Jeep that you have to purchase secondhand, which is quite useful, which is the 74HC 4078, which is an eight input OR and NOR, also only available in the HC family. So, yeah, so I find this table really useful because it really lists the gates I'm limiting to using and their speed. And so I'm going to try to optimize the address decoding circuit using this data to be as fast as possible. So let's get started. So the first thing I'm noticing here is that we have three NAND gates and one of them is a three input one. So I'm going to make all of them three inputs. Uh, this is going to be a 74AC10 chip, which is three input NAND. The 138 is also going to be from the AC family. Uh, so everything should still pass. Then we have the 8 input uh, NAND gate here. And as you can see, the 8 input NAND is only available in HC unless you go to the specialty 74 ACT 11030, which is quite expensive. For now, I'm going to use the HC version and we'll see later if we need to optimize this. So then there's a the question of the bank zero signal. So for that, I'm going to start out by using the obsolete uh, HC4078 because it's really useful to be able to have that many inputs in the chip. Uh, we'll see later if I'm able to optimize this away. And then finally, there's this NOR gate here. And since it's four signals, we also have a spare input here. I think we can split this into two gates, two NOR gates, and then just connect a second uh, to that input here. So let's make this a two input NOR gate. There we go. And so that's going to be uh, two input NOR. So it's going to be a, an AC02. And then we're going to have two spare NOR gates. So I'm going to use them to invert A15 here for the RAM space. And we need to connect it to ground in order to get an inverter. It's also going to be an AC02. Let's run the tests. Okay, we're still passing. All right, so this is a real world implementation of our decoding circuits. Uh, so in total, that's one, two, three, four, five chips. Let's um, compute the propagation delays of all those signals and see where we're at. So if you look at the GitHub repository of the project, you can find the timing diagrams that we already made at the bottom. And we know that the bank address is going to be available 44.5 seconds after the falling edge of the clock. And the contamination delay is going to be 11 nanoseconds. So we know that in here, it's going to be a minimum of 11 nanoseconds and a maximum of 44.5. And that's going to be for pins A23 to A16. Then we also have the propagation delay of the regular address pins of the CPU. And if you look at the data sheet, the pins A0 to A15 here are going to be at a minimum of TAH and a maximum of TADS. TAH and TADS is 10 to 30 nanoseconds. So in here we can say 10 to 30, and that's going to be for pins A7 to A15. Then I'm going to put here the propagation delays of all the gates that we're using. And we're going to be able to compute everything based on this. This signal is going to be directly off of the address line. So it's going to be 11 to 44.5. This signal is going to go through an ACO2. So we have to add a 2.9 to this number and 11.5 to this number. And this one is going to be the same uh, because it's also an ACO2. And then this is going to go through an AC10, which is not correct here. AC10 is one to eight. So this is going to be, so the minimum is 11 plus one is going to be 12. And then the maximum of those three is 56 plus eight. That's going to be 64. After the falling edge of the clock, it's going to take at a minimum of 12 nanoseconds and a maximum of 64 nanoseconds for the external RAM chip select to be active. 
Let me skip the part where I do all the remaining calculations and uh, go directly to the results. Okay, so, so what impact does that have on the frequency that we can run at? If we look at the data sheet for the 65C22 versatile interface adapter, this is going to be the chip that is going to be the most restrictive on what we can do with our chip selects. And the reason for this is the TACR value, which is going to be at five volts, a minimum of 10 nanoseconds. So we need the chip select to be set up 10 nanoseconds before the rising edge of the clock. As you can see here, the rising edge of the clock is here. We need the address, the chip select, the register select, etc., to be set up 10 nanoseconds before the rising edge of the clock. And in a write cycle, this is TACW. And similarly, TACW is a minimum of 10 nanoseconds. So if our chip select for the IO chip is 75.8 nanoseconds, and it needs to happen 10 nanoseconds before the rising edge, this means that a half period of the clock needs to be greater than 38.5 plus 10, which is 88.5 nanoseconds, which means that the clock needs to be larger than 177 nanoseconds, which means that the frequency needs to be lower than 5.6 megahertz. And so that's actually quite okay. Remember in the goals of this project, my goal is to run at four megahertz. So this circuit would actually work for address decoding. So one thing you can notice is that the HC30 is definitely fine. There's a margin of 15 nanoseconds more that we could use before it would become significant. But similarly, there is quite a high margin with all the signals going through the AC02. And I'm thinking we can actually replace that with an HCO2. So let's see what that would look like. So clearly the worst case scenario comes from the chain of the AC138 and the HC4078, along with a bit of delay on the bank address latching here. So if we wanted the CPU to run faster, this is what we would have to optimize. But as I said, my goal is to go to a maximum of four megahertz. I think I'm going to build it like that for now. And once I have the completed CPU, we're going to go back and probably move everything to programmable logic anyway. So um, I don't think we need to optimize any further here. Okay, so we haven't added a lot to our circuit here in this episode. We've only added the emulation LED, but we did do some great groundwork. We decided on a memory map and figured out a decoding circuit. So this is great stuff that we're going to be able to use in the future videos. And in the next video, I'll be able to add some ROM to the circuits so we can execute a real program. Uh, so that's going to be pretty cool. So I hope you enjoyed this one. Let me know in the comments if you've got any questions or feedback. And I hope to see you in the next one. Goodbye.